So today's talk is on uh, uh, AFB and other B pathogens, parasites, and problems. So without any further ado, here's Bonnie. Well, thank you so much for having me tonight. It's nice seeing you guys. Uh, hope you're all having a good year. That's exciting that you're going to have an in-person workshop with Randy soon. Um, I know I, I started doing my first in-person field workshops again recently, and a couple weeks ago, it was really exciting. We were able to have three. Everyone's fully vaccinated, so no masks, which was very exciting. So, okay. Let me... <clears throat> so when I teach, um, getting into like the, gosh, this is kind of the, the bummer stuff about beekeeping. When I teach beginner beekeeping classes, um, I have a top 10 for new beekeepers. And number seven is know thy bee enemies. There are a lot of them out there. But what I tell beginner beekeepers is, you know, what's important is in your first year to focus on two. Um, Varroa, learning about how to identify them and what to do with them, um, because that's most likely the reason you're gonna lose your colony. And American fowl brood. Um, hopefully you're not gonna see it, but because it's so contagious, we all need to know what it is. We all need to protect each other. There's just too many beekeepers out there. Um, before I get into that, I'm just curious, you know, I know that um, your county has had some issues. Where are you guys with dealing with foul brood? I mean, are there any of you in this meeting tonight that have it or know people with it? Anyone want to speak up? Jerry, do you just want to give a report? Uh, I had yeah. uh, an acquaintance with uh, a colony that had uh, some, actually some equipment that had a colony with foul brood in it. Um, it was from the west end of Berkeley and uh, all that stuff has been taken care of. So is it, is it subsiding a little bit? I know here yeah. in Marin, you know, we were seeing two or three cases a year that in 2019, there were nine cases that I personally saw or knew about that mm -hmm. were not even in clusters. They were all over the county, um, which was really concerning. And now it seems like we're not, we, we haven't seen as much last year and, and knock on wood, I haven't seen any cases so far this year. Um, yeah, it, we, we expected a lot and have not had that. I mean, we, we put some, you know, we did a lot of education last I'm year on, on American Foul Bridge. And, uh, oh, by the way, anyone who's not, uh, everyone except for Bonnie should, should mute themselves so we don't, uh, we don't interrupt her. But anyway, yeah, so we, we, we were expecting, we actually have a program in place where um, we'll pay for the destruction, the destruction of the hive, the club well. And um, so far, I think we've used it once or twice. Uh, Jerry, help me there. Has it been? Uh, I have not been aware of any any payouts uh, for equipment or for services. Oh, less than once or twice. <laughs> that that's great. That's great news because I know it was a it was a problem for a while. And um, yeah, like Jim said, if you can meet yourself, great. But if you have questions, feel free, free to pop in and ask them as I go along. So, but back to Bonnie, I, Bonnie, I just want to add that I, I think a lot of AFB would show up at any rate, like September, as they're starting, their numbers are starting to get small. It's just going to consume. Well, well, it kind of it can come at any time because sometimes people that you know don't realize they they that's why their colony died over the winter. It can spread then in the spring or if they're trying to reoccupy colonies where it was diseased uh, equipment, but, but I'll, I'll get into that. So American fowl brood for new beekeepers, um, this is a bacterium that causes this. It's, um, you know, 120, 30, 40 years ago, um, this was as bad as varroa mites today. It resulted in the destruction of, of many uh, apiaries. It's one of the reasons why packages are so popular because many states um, would not allow combs to cross over state borders at that time because of foul brood. Um, it's, it's really, it's, a, it's affected, it affects the larva. Um, the adult bees can carry the disease but not affected by it. Um, and the spores are incredibly resistant for, you know, de desiccation, heat, disinfectants, whatever. I mean, they have, uh, they have spores in, in labs that are viable 70 and I think, you know, even 80 years now. Um, 
So it's it's very like it's it's something that all of us need to know about as beekeepers, especially as beekeeping has exploded in urban areas where there's a lot of of, of close bees. You know, you really don't um, for the commercial guys. You know, I think they expect about a one to two percent infestation of, of or a problem with American fowlbird per year, um, but they're looking for it. Um, and, I, and I think that's unfortunate. I know Jennifer um, thankfully had something in the American Beekeeping Journal a couple of years ago about foul brood um, from Biofuel Oasis, but you really don't see it in a lot of the journals, like or really like where people are talking about it. And I think that's primarily just because the commercial guys know what it is and they're looking for it. Um, and it's my biggest concern with backyard beekeepers. So how do they get it? Um, these are young larvae and they get infected by um, being fed um, spores. Um, I have read, you know, one day old larvae needs to be fed about 10 spores. I've, I've read 10 to 35. Um, the old larvae are not susceptible, just like the adults are not susceptible. Um, and, and usually then the, the death is gonna occur after the cell has been capped. Um, the scales that I'm going to show you a picture of in a little while, that's the vet, which is the um, reproductive phase. It usually takes about five weeks before those form. But, you know, looking back up here, it, it only takes very few spores for a larva to become infected. But each dead larva that becomes a reproductive phase can contain as many as 100 million spores. So even though it's, it's kind of hard for a colony to really become infected, you can see like if it gets rolling, it just, it's, it's very difficult for them to contain it. Um, so in a colony, what you might see are punctured and sunken cappings what, while bees are still in there. And very unique to American fowl brood is that this, this larva will rope out. So if you have a concern that foul brood is in your living colony, you can take a twig or a um, toothpick or, or, or anything and twirl it around in there. And, and it's the only um, disease where you're actually, it, that larva is gonna rope out, like just like it's pictured here. And nothing else will do that. If you stick that in even something that's diseased, you know, like it's been infected by, by a disease that the mites have vectored or something else, nothing else is gonna do this. The other thing that you're looking for, and especially if you, you have a colony that died out during winter, I'm always looking for this. If a colony has died out, I'm always looking for these scales in it, just to be sure. Now, sometimes, so this is kind of a, a looking upside down. So think about gravity. Um, if you have an infected uh, larva, that gravity is gonna take it down to the bottom of cell. And, and basically what happens is it becomes this kind of schlumpy tar looking thing. The nurse bees will try to clean it out, but <clears throat> they can't, I mean, it's really stuck there. But unfortunately then the nurse bees, like we said, this is, this is millions of spores. So those nurse bees go into that cell, they're trying to clean it out, um, but they can't get it out. But what they do is coat themselves with the AFB spores, and then they go out and they're feeding young. They're, they're traveling around the colony. So if you have a colony that's died out, look carefully for this. Um, sometimes what can happen is a colony dies for other reasons and um, it dies pretty quickly. And so the bees haven't, had a chance, like they just weren't a strong enough population to clean it out. And, and you can get kind of what kind of looks like this, um, but isn't. And I'm gonna talk about that in a second, how you can figure that out. How do you get it as a beekeeper? Um, and this is of course a concern in areas where it's just kind of harboring and people haven't dealt with it. So beekeepers spreading contaminated frames and equipment are one of the primary reasons you spread it. So you have a dead out colony. You don't realize um, that's why it died. You reintroduce bees to it in the spring. You share those frames with someone else. You share them with other colonies. Um, you can feed contaminated honey to bees. So you're not gonna see those spores that might be in honey that you're feeding to other bees. 
you can have colonies robbing out infected hives. So, um, you know, they're, they're going in there, they're taking home honey, um, possibly are getting some spores on them. That's kind of less likely that they're gonna spread it that way. But if they're bringing that food home that's infected and feeding it, uh, drifting bees or swarms from infected colonies. How do you confirm that you have it? Um, one way is to get tested by the USDA. Um, this has been a free service for over 130 years. Um, and this is one of the reasons why the Beltsville lab was set up because of foul brood. Uh, of course, due to COVID, the, the lab for a while postponed all testing. Now they're operating under a limited capacity. So if it's something you need to get tested, go onto their website and there's an email um, for Samuel on there. You can, um, you can contact him and see what the latest is. There are kits available through bee supply companies, but they're not as reliable. Um, the Holtz milk test is a test that detects the presence of the enzyme um, that the bacteria releases. But really, you know, one of the most helpful things are those scales. And um, specifically, like if you have a black light, and I know the Marin beekeepers, we have a couple of portable ones that we'll, we'll share with people. Um, the AFB scales, if you view them under a black light, will glow. Um, nothing else is gonna glow. So remember I mentioned like you can have like larvae that die just because they didn't have enough bees that were in the colony at the time to take care of them. But if, if those, if you put it under a black light, they're not gonna glow. Foul brood, I mean, it, it smells foul. Um, not to be confused with that gym scent of coyote bush that comes in the fall. Um, it's got a very different scent, but is foul. Um, and again, uh, like I was saying, the punctured and sunken cells. So technically, legally, um, if you have it, you are supposed to um, dispose of the hives and their contacts, uh, contents. Specifically, you're supposed to burn them. Um, that's all well and good, but you know, here in, um, in this area with spare the air days and wildfire concerns, that's a whole lot easier said than done. Um, Jim, you were saying that you guys have a, a way to deal with your equipment now? Yeah, so we actually, um, we've taken them to the, the pet crematorium, I think it's the one in Livermore. And uh, they've disposed of them for us. They have the, you know, they have the cleaners on the, you know, for the crematorium, and we they'll they'll do it, and they charge us per pound. That, that's outstanding. So here in Marin, um, we we also have partnered with our uh, local humane society um, to incinerate them, um, and it's it's great that Alameda and Marin both have an option for this because my understanding is most. Um, most counties in the Bay Area and for, for just local beekeepers in, um, in California really don't have an option. So it's great that you do. And I, I would encourage you if you do have foul brood to, to please take advantage of that and get rid of that. If you can't find an immediate burn solution, it sounds like you have one, but I know here in Marin, even when we take them to the Marin, uh, Marin Humane, we have to make special arrangements and appointments. Um, and if you can't find an immediate burn solution, you really need to secure that equipment like triple wrapped in plastic bags in a bee proof place under your house, in your garage, somewhere, just make sure no bees can access that. Um, well, what about the bees themselves? I mean, so as I was saying, technically, legally, they're supposed to be thrown away too. Um, but you really, there, there is actually a way to um, clean up the bees um, without throwing them into the fire. So it's a, it's a two-step process. One is shaking all those bees into a cardboard nuke box with a single frame. You wait for 24 hours. You know, those bees were not, it's not like swarming where they've gorged themselves with honey and are ready for this. You've just like sprung this on them where, where they, they haven't gorged with honey. Um, so 
If you put them into that, wait for 24 hours, they're gonna potentially use up any contaminated honey that's in their stomachs, either just by consuming it or by building out comb with it. Um, and then you can move them into a new permanent home. Um, definitely depending on the time of year, you're probably gonna need to help them out with built out combs if you have them and, and feeding to get them through that. Um, you can treat with antibiotics. However, keep in mind, there is some, in fact, there's quite a lot of resistance with antibiotics and that only treats the vegetative state. That's not dealing with the reproducing spores. So that's not dealing with those scales that are potentially in your combs. Um, and now you need a prescription from a veterinarian to obtain antibiotics for bees. Um, Jim and Jerry, do you guys have a veterinarian in Alameda that will help you with that if you need that right now? I, I don't think the club does. I, I you know, We use one for the ranch, uh, you know, or a cattle ranch as well. Yeah. We have our, our standard cattle vet. Yeah, so it, it's not necessarily easy to get. And, um, and, and you know, it's, it's really hard because this is a fairly new uh, feed directive. Um, to even have veterinarians that are comfortable doing this or even understand what Falbert is. Um, this is, and I think, um, I, I know that Jerry in the past, you guys have shared this um, particular um, uh, uh, research about shaking um, and, and how that's an effective way. So that's what I was referring to back here about shaking them out, cleaning them up. And, uh, and moving them on to new equipment without like any treatments or anything else. Um, so this is, you know, this is from 140, 50 years ago, um, but this is a, a pretty effective way to like save the bees. Um, and I'm happy to like pass this on if you don't already have this. It's so important though, just to keep in mind that, you know, we are all in this together. And as a community, we all need to continue helping each other, sharing with each other, um, because it is so, it is so contagious. Um, we, we have to work together as communities to address this. And it sounds like in Alameda, you know, I know that um, not a few, it wasn't so many years ago that it was a major problem. Um, I know when I did a talk in person, um, you know, between the question I asked for people to raise their hands if they were dealing with foul brood or knew someone with foul brood or knew someone that had had it, 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 was, it was a pretty substantial um, portion of the group. So it's great to hear that that's coming under control. Um, in Marin too, we're working really hard to try to continually educate people and talk about this. And if you do have a dead out, I can't stress this enough, you've got to be sure you can rule out American foul brood um, and or get the uh, equipment into a bee proof place and, and until you can get the assistance to do this. And this is one of the benefits of being part of a, a beekeeping group um, because we are all in this together and reaching out for new beekeepers. Um, ask, ask for help, ask for help, like identifying, um, doing an autopsy on your hive and figuring out why it died. Again, I can't stress this enough. It's highly contagious. So for the sake of your bees and your, your fellow beekeepers, you know, um, this is something that all new beekeepers should take the time to learn to identify and be ready to act quickly if you do find it. Um, you know, it, it has been the case where it's not necessarily the most likely thing that's going to kill your bees, um, but because, it, because it's so contagious, it's important we all know what it is. Um, moving on to the thing that's most likely going to kill your bees is really bee enemy number one, the Varroa mites. So these parasitic mites evolved with um, Asian honeybees. They arrived in the United States about 30 years ago, and we did what we do so well in the U.S. when we have a problem. We take a pill and throw a chemical at it. And now, um, you know, we've, we've bred super mites. So, um, you know, it's, it is a problem. And the biggest problem might not be the mites themselves, but all the diseases they vector. So these little dirty hypodermic needles, 
which, um, you know, as I know Sammy's spoken to you a couple times uh, about all of his research. I mean, so they're, they're, they're sucking into the fat bodies of the bees, which is essentially their liver. Um, and they're, they are a little dirty hypodermic needles. So they're spreading all these diseases with them. One of the ones that's most obvious and easy to see is deformed wing virus. And really, you know, our, our first line of defense is disease resistant, or I'm sorry, mite resistant or tolerant bees. So whenever you're inspecting your hive, um, always be on the lookout for ways that the bees may or may not be dealing with the mites on their own. You know, that's, that's a great thing to be tracking in your hive journals. So positive signs, um, uncapping of pupa. So some bees can recognize um, where the cells where the mites are breeding and by uncapping the pupa, um, they, can, they can stop this, this reproductive cycle. Um, this has been well documented in the Russian bees um, where even they can you know, uncap these pupa uh, either remove the mites or the female leaves and they can recap them um, and that pupa can fully develop. Also periods of reduction or stoppage of brood rearing. Um, I was pretty obsessed with, uh, th with this for quite a few years. We, we even did a two year research study on this and weren't able to really document this. But again, uh, going back to the Russians, some of these bees that are really sensitive to changes in and shifts in nectar and pollen where they may stop rearing brood, um, any rear stoppage of that period um, is going to break the reproductive cycle of the mites. So I'm always on the lookout for this. And you can see here um, this uncapping of pupa. You know, the, that pupa, they don't have any fully developed mouth parts. They were not the ones that chewed holes in that. This would have been the worker bees. And um, I had a bet with someone who said, well, there can be a lot of reasons why they might uncap pupa. And we spent a whole day going to yards and any cell that we saw this in, we pulled them out of. And in 100% of the cases, we found evidence of mites in those cells. So this is a, this is a characteristic that I see in all of our breeder colonies. Um, and this is something I wanna see in all colonies, you know, heading into summer and late winter. I mean, sorry, late summer. So some, th some things we wanna be concerned about, you know, the way, if your bees build um, drone brood in between the boxes, that's a great opportunity to look at what's in those cells. And look here, this, this drone, these, these drone cells, look what they were full of. I mean, just totally infested. I mean, adult um, female mites, immature, really immature. We've got some males here, male mites. And, and look at all that feces from the mites. Um, this was a really interesting colony actually, because when I, when I got in here, um, this was in an apiary of ours that was treatment free. And I thought they were doomed and they went through a broodless period after this and totally cleaned themselves up. It was kind of cool. But I worry about this, you know, and I would, if I were you, I would worry about this if I saw this in my, in my drone cells. Obviously, if you're seeing bee of row on bees or walking on frames, that's reason for concern. Look at this poor girl. This was a bee that got stuck under a monitoring board. <laughs> Look at all those mites. Uh, if you see unhealthy bees, so deformed wing virus, virus here, that, that is a virus that is specifically vectored by mites. So if you see that, that, that is a sign that there are mites in your colony. Unhealthy larva, and in this case, looking close, oops. Looking closer, not only is it unhealthy larva, you know, she this schlumpy brood here, but you can actually see the mites on it. And just comparing that with healthy brood. So, you know, I always tell beekeepers, like there's, there's four things you should be looking for every time you go into a colony. Do you have a queen? So either see her evidence of her like eggs 
Um, do they have enough food? Do they have enough space or too much space? And what does their, their larva look like? And look at that. I mean, that is healthy, white, well-fed fat larva as compared with that. That's what you wanna be seeing. There's some more nice larva. I actually, like you can see the green grass here. So this was spring, but um, you know, I actually get concerned when I see these perfect brood frames um, later in the summer, if it's colony that hasn't been treated or monitored for mites. Um, because if, if I'm not seeing uncapped pupa or something else, it's like, it's probably mites are there somewhere, but are the bees not doing anything about it? Sometimes like with these, all these mites on this drone, you know, you can clearly see you have a problem, but a lot of times you don't. And, and I hear that a lot. People say, you know, like, oh, I, I've been keeping an eye out. I've never seen, you know, problems. I've never seen a mite in my colony. You're not necessarily going to see it because again, I mean, the feeding is happening under the abdomen, slipped in between the scales feeding. So unless you're flipping bees over and analyzing that and really getting a close look, you're not gonna see that. And you're not gonna see those mites that are inside those cappings with that pupa. Um, so if you really wanna know what kind of mite infestation you have, you, really, you need to do a sugar roll or, or an alcohol wash. And look at this alcohol wash. Th this was actually one that Randy did here years ago at an apiary when he was doing a workshop. and from all looks of the colony, you know, there, there weren't any obvious diseases, there weren't any problems, but look at that. They're clearly, you know, with the wash, you see the problems. I know some people keep bees on um, monitoring boards, but you know, um, that study that I mentioned that we did for two years, where every two weeks for two years, we were monitoring um, 24 hour mite counts on those boards um, as well as a lot of other data. But what was really interesting is the bees that the colonies that survived and these were untreated colonies were the ones that had the highest average and the highest um, actual mite counts. So to me, like I don't give a lot of stock into anything that's happening on a screen bottom board because what is that really saying to us? I mean, from this data, it seems to be saying that maybe the monitoring boards where we weren't seeing any mites, they weren't good groomers. There was something else happening there where the ones that were surviving where we were seeing a lot of mites, maybe there were better groomers. Maybe they were just doing a better job cleaning up the mites. So, you know, you, you can't judge from a screen bottom board what's happening on the bees. And here you can kind of see some of those my counts. Any questions about um, the foul brood or mites before I move on to other bee issues? Bonnie, would you go back to the slide before this one? I can take a picture of it. Thank you. I have a quick question. Um, so being a new hive, two months old, what are the odds of it having um, burrow already? That really depends on where it came from and what they did, but, but chances are good. I mean, a lot of packages and nukes come with, with mites. I mean, I, I tend to tell people like, if, you're, if, you're, if it's coming from a source where they're actively selecting for mite resistance, you're probably gonna be okay through the summer. Um, with our with our program, um, it's it's unusual for us to have to treat more than once a year, and usually that's late summer and fall. Um, but definitely by the time you get into late July or August, you should be you know checking your levels and seeing where they're at. So follow up question: Would you recommend just going ahead and treating or testing first? I would test. I like, I like to know my levels. I don't want to treat unless a colony really needs it. I mean, if they're dealing with things on their own, great. Um, having said that, you know, even if you've got a colony where you've seen like hygienic behavior, they're uncapping, they're, they seem to be good groomers, they've got high, low mite levels. Um, as you get into fall, you really need to keep a close eye on it because your bees are going to be impacted by what's happening with other bees in the neighborhood. So 
think of flowers as, as dirty doorknobs. You know, um, the, these mites, like if, if they're in a colony that's crashing, they're blind, but they have a great sense of smell. They will hop onto foragers, get off on flowers and wait for bees from another colony to hop onto and find a ride. Um, your bees could also find a crashing colony and relieve them of their honey as well as take home all their disease problems or, or all their mite problems. I had, a, I had a client a couple of years ago. She was a new beekeeper and her, her mite level was relatively low. Like if it was me, I wouldn't have treated, but she wanted to treat because the bees came from um, a, a good friend of hers and she, she wanted to make sure they got through, right? So we, we did a formic treatment on them, which is you know, 97, 98% effective. Two weeks later, went in to remove those pads, um, and she and she asked me to do another mite test. They um, they had after a, a treatment like that, which is that effective, their mite count had increased thirteen percent. Wow, that can't be explained by them, <laughs> you know, like the mites actually breeding in their colony. Um, that was all about them finding a colony and bringing it home. And then I found out there was a treatment-free beekeeper about five doors away who had a colony crash a week before. Mm. So that colony clearly found them, relieved them of their honey, and brought their mite problems home. So, you know, it's really important if, if you want to stay on top of that stuff, keep on top of it in summer and, and fall to see where you're at. Mm -hmm. and, and it's also kind of interesting, especially if you're just getting into beekeeping, like to understand like your stock, like what stock you're bringing, do they have any resistance? And you're not going to know that unless you're actually checking it out and seeing what kind of levels they have. Would you recommend, I'm, I'm pretty sure you know what you're going to say, but the sugar roll versus the alcohol wash. Uh, personally, uh, most of my clients are, are, do not want me to do an alcohol wash in their colony. You know, the alcohol wash, no one survives that. Yeah. And for a lot of my a lot of my clients who, you know, they've got one or two colonies and these are like their pets, they don't want me doing that to them. So um, I, I primarily do the, the sugar roll. Well, I mean, I've, I've read, I, I don't know if this is true or not, but the, the sugar roll is about 90% effective or efficient versus the uh, alcohol wash. I, I think it's incredibly efficient. I think it gives you most of the information you need. And again, most of the bees are gonna make it out alive. And especially if you're a new beekeeper who's maybe not sure about identifying your queens, um, you know, if you get a queen in that alcohol wash, she's not, she's not making it out of there alive. Yeah. But there's a pretty good chance if she makes it into a sugar roll, she will. A couple of years ago, uh, we, uh... Randy, we, Randy was giving a workshop and uh, we directly compared the sugar rolls to the uh, alcohol wash. And if you sort of shake for like a minute or so, we found that uh, 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 almost 100% recovery with sugar roll. Because we, we used the same bees and then saw what extra mites came off with the alcohol. So, so you're saying like, I mean, basically it was the same. Yeah. 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 I, I know for Randy and for commercial beekeepers, the alcohol wash is, um, is it's just a lot quicker if you're doing a whole lot of colonies. Um, but if you just have one or two, the sugar roll works pretty well. And, you know, I even know like, you know, I love Randy. Randy's a mentor and he's like, oh, it's only 300 bees. But, you know, like for me, it's like 300 bees, you know, I mean, gosh, we get upset when a couple of people die in our community. Like how about 300? <laughs> so I don't know. I prefer the sugar roll, <laughs> you know, but, but I can understand how, you know, it's, it can be a lot quicker to do the alcohol wash. But very important, I, I would I would advise all of you if you're new beekeepers, I mean, learn how to do a sugar roll, learn, learn how to do that just so, so you can do that with your bees. And you're what you're you're really looking for, although Randy's data shows, you know, like pretty consistent data across different frames. Um, but if you're looking for nurse bees, you want to go to frames with um, open larva or pollen. Okay, moving on to other hive problems. Um, yellow jackets, how have your yellow jackets been over in the East Bay in recent years? 
Okay, not so okay. I, I'm anticipating, you know, with our mega drought year, I know the last like significant drought year we had was 2014. And I know in Marin, um, yellow jacket activity really ramped up, you know, with this mega drought, everyone's gonna be hungry. Everyone's gonna be looking for water resources. And, you know, these yellow jackets who only overwinter as a queen, but um, with our Mediterranean climate by the end of the summer, um, they can be five to 10,000 in a colony. And um, a colony of bees is a, is a pretty enticing place um, to get a lot of like protein and carbohydrates. Um, these pictures here, this was, um, I, I went to pick up, uh, we did a study with Penn State in 2012. And while I was going around picking up um, the pollen samples collected by people, this guy said, hey, do you want to see my colonies? And I said, oh, sure, that'd be great. How are they doing? Oh, they're doing great. And I walked up there. There were as many yellow jackets going in as there were honeybees. So in these pictures, those are yellow jackets. There's a few honeybees here. That's a yellow jacket. Yellow jacket, yellow jacket, honeybee, honeybee. Um, same thing here in this picture. Actually, when I walked up here, the entrance reducer was not in. There was a Boardman feeder. And the yellow jackets were going in and helping themselves to that as well as the bees. Unfortunately, about a month after this picture was taken, this colony was gone. The yellow jackets already knew what was in there. And even though I reduced this entrance substantially, um, <clears throat> they just totally decimated the colony. Yeah, uh, Bonnie, last year um, I had some small nukes that after the fires, they got small my it's just like they went into early winter from all the smoke yeah and then um and then i got robbed and the hives that fit, that fended off the robbing uh had to succumb to yellow jackets they because i was feeding they could smell that sugar water even if it was not on a boardman but inside on top of the inner cover yeah they were going up into the inner cover and hitting the sugar water. Yeah, I think we're all going to have to keep a close eye out for the yellow jackets. I'm, I'm expecting greater problems with predation. And like you said, you know, I mean, we might need to be feeding our bees this year. I, I'm anticipating that. And I'm already, it's unusual in our area to ever have to feed overwintered colonies. And we're already seeing in some in some parts of the county where we're needing to uh, support overwinter colonies with extra feeding, which we usually would never need to do. But that that brings the other problem of you know ants, yellow jackets. Um, so I think we're all going to be need to be a little more vigilant this year. What the other, what? The other thing too, uh, real quick, is I found that the yellow jackets figured out robbing screens. Yeah, sometimes they do. And sometimes the bees don't figure them out in time and they're them trying to get in through them. Um, it just creates an opportunity for the yellow jackets to pick them off. So um, I, I'd like, I would like to say, if you do hang traps, you need to start hanging them before you see the yellow jackets. It's a little late this season, um, but I always recommend to people like start hanging them February, early March. Um, you want to try to catch those queens before they start establishing their colonies for the season. And unfortunately, I think a, a lot of people wait until they have a problem. But as I said, they can get it to 5,000, 10,000 in a colony. So if people wait too late in the season, um, once you have a problem, you might be too late. Oh, so Bonnie, sorry, can I just ask one quick question? Sorry to, to interrupt. Yeah. So I've already found one dead yellow jacket by my hive. Mm -hmm. um which I was like okay the girls took care of that problem how last year I had a big yellow jacket problem at my property um I'm kind of in the rural area on Crow Canyon how far would you hang these traps from the I, don't, I don't like having them in visual distance when I can avoid it um, but the thing that you can, like, so this, this client called me and said, oh my gosh, I'm having a terrible time with yellow jackets. Actually, he didn't call me, he emailed me. I hardly ever answer my phone <laughs> or check messages. And, and so I went by and he literally had these yellow jacket traps hanging right next to his hive. So no, no kidding, you've got a problem because that pheromone is just luring them to that location. 
Um, but what can uh, you know help them? Smaller entrances. So in this, I always, I, I pretty much always. There's always exceptions, but for the most part, all of our hives year round have entrance reducers set to medium. And if they need to be shut down more, I have little blocks of wood. In this picture, uh, I kept trying to get a picture of it and I couldn't, this was 2014 when, and most of these, these are not foragers, these are guard bees for this little tiny hole. The yellow jackets were so bad and they're actually balling yellow jacket right here that you can't see. So smaller entrances are gonna help. Um, fake hornet's nests. Um, you can get these at uh, hardware stores. They're like paper, they look like Chinese paper lanterns. Um, or you can just take a, a, a paper bag, a lunch bag, wad it up and kind of re reshape it. So hornets are a predator of yellow jackets. And just that visual deterrent can be incredibly effective for deterring yellow jackets. Um, in this particular yard, um, the, the yellow jacket activity decreased by about 80% just hanging this paper bag. And it was horrific. It was like, you know, 10 yellow jackets tackling a forager returning, getting it on the ground and ripping it apart. Um, and then very little activity after this one. And that's the paper bag, the, um, the, the, the fake hornet's nests that they sell at, at hardware stores or other stores are do a much more convincing job of looking like hornet's nests. And with those, you want to hang them close to your hives. You want to yeah. deter those yellow jackets. Robber screens, like you said, might be helpful. Some of them, you know, they, they figure out or could be confusing to the bees. I'm going to um, watch the rest of the bee meeting. <laughs> Um, uh, balsamic vinegar. This was a trick that was given to us by a restaurateur who said that when he had problems in his outdoor e uh, eating area in the summer, he would put plates of balsamic vinegar. And we actually found that to be incredibly helpful. Okay, next potential problem, ants. Ugh. And, and again, like I'm anticipating predation, including with ants to be a bigger problem this year. In this particular situation, I put some feed on this colony trying to help them and it just created more problems for them. So reducing the hive size may allow bees to better defend their home. There's a lot of different ant deterrents. Um, uh, boric acid, this is boric acid here. Uh, flypaper, cinnamon, all those are incredibly effective, but have their pros and cons. Um, bees can get stuck to flypaper on the legs of stands. Cinnamon's expensive and washes away with any water. Same thing with this boric acid. Um, my favorite way of deal now of dealing with, with ant problems are these anti-ant platforms. Super cheap. It's just plywood, some bolts. Um, and then on the legs of these bolts, a mixture of 50-50 baby oil and Vaseline. Mike Turner saw this on a YouTube video, I don't know how many years ago. It's amazing. I mean, non-toxic. Um, the Vaseline is what helps stick it on the bolts. It's the baby oil that deters them. And unlike um, Tanglefoot or the flypaper, the bees aren't attracted to it, so they don't get stuck on it. Um, so really cheap, really effective. So we've got a lot of these stands, haven't had to use them a lot in recent years, but may have to you know, bring them all out this year. Um, we just pop a hive on top of one if there's a problem or if we anticipate there might be a problem and it, it takes care of the problem usually within a day. I don't know if you guys see much of this uh, along the coast in particular and in the spring here, we do see a bit of it and that's chalk brood. So this is a fungal brood disease. Um, the bees will ingest the spores with their larval food. And um, basically the reason it's called chalk brood is it looks like a little piece of chalk. I mean, that larva just becomes really hardened uh, when it reaches this black stage, those are the fruiting bodies.
probably not surprising that this colony had all the problems they had. They're right on the coast and it's on a screen bottom board. So cool. Um, yeah, I mean, they just really had a problem. But if you see this, you really need to dispose of those mummies and not on the ground. I mean, you need to like get those in a bag and, and dispose of them, get them away from your apiary totally um, and, and clean your tools. So if we ever deal with a, a colony that has chalk brood, um, we always take our propane torch and torch our hive tools. To reduce the likelihood, you want to keep it in a sunny location with good air circulation, dry conditions. Um, if you need to, remove the infected combs. If, you, if it, the disease is severe and just persists, you might need to consider requeening. And make sure that bottom board is dry throughout the year. Um, you can also um, you can get a product called ProDFM from the bee supply companies. It's a microbial and a probiotic. Um, and that does seem to have some um, efficacy dealing with chalk root. In fact, I was at a client in um, Belvedere today who had a colony that was just had terrible chalk root um, and uh, it didn't see a single cell. And we basically got them on a, uh, a solid bottom board and have been treating with pro DFM for a couple months now. A few other pests that we see, see but don't seem to cause too many problems for us, um, wax moths. So this is a frame that was once built out comb, but was totally decimated by them. So in general, um, I mean, they definitely can be a serious pest in warm, wet areas, even on strong colonies. Um, Gary and I were visiting a beekeeper in Fiji and I mean, even his strongest colonies had problems with, with wax moth. And boy, if you took a, a, a frame of a built out comb off a colony, that was just gonna be decimated in pretty much no time. Here, they're usually only a problem with poorly stored equipment. So, um, the, you know, their, their reproduction, they like dark places with not a lot of air movement. So if you have a closed up hive that's empty, that's a great place for them to breed, uh, breed. especially in, in warmer months, um, the reproductive rate it increases exponentially with warm, warm conditions. Here's a picture of a colony like that. And these are all, all of these are individual, uh, these are pupa here. And they'll, they'll uh, kind of, you know, um, chew into your woodenware too and your frames. Um, so because they reproduce most readily without light and air, either free, freeze your frames before storing. So if you've got enough freezer space where you can pop a frame in or frames in for 24 or 48 hours, then you can put them in a plastic bag and tie them up. But you just got to get rid of the inevitable um, wax moth larva and or eggs that are on your frames. Um, we don't have, you know, our freezer is, you know, literally like this big. So we, we can't do that. I can't even fit one frame into our freezer. Um, so we store ours and we don't have a, a large enough space indoors. Not that we would necessarily want to do that. So we store them outside stacked up with um, shims in between them. This is actually too much space, these up here because a mouse can get through that. So you really don't want um, shims thicker than three eighths of an inch. And you can see here, we, we have them on screen bottom boards and we've totally blocked off the bottom so mice can't get in. And that's pretty effective. Another problem, small hive beetles, uh, about the size of a ladybug uh, with paddle shaped antenna that you can see here. This is an African species. Um, I'm not sure about Alameda, but here in Marin, um, they arrived about eight years ago. I can tell you exactly where they arrived actually. Um, like wax moss, they're a serious pest in areas where it's warm and humid, like the Southeast and Hawaii. Um, and here, this is actually, this picture was taken in Maui. Look at all these nasty larvae on this frame and they've slimed out the honey and the box here with all that like wet that you see, that's the sliming out of the honey. These poor bees, the queen had stopped laying. They were like just in a small area and cluster. 
How bad is it really going to be here? I don't know. I mean, so eight years here in Marin, not too many reported problems with slime outs. I've only seen four myself in the eight years time. Um, I know they were on the peninsula uh, uh, probably a decade before they made it to Marin. Um, and, you know, the attitude down there when I was doing some workshops about 10 years ago was like, eh, small high beetle, you know, you can't take off frames of honey and just leave them in your garage anymore to potentially feed back later in the season because um, they could get slimed out. And when you extract your honey, you need to get those wets back on hives quicker. Long term, I, I don't really know. I mean, I definitely know here in Marin, like I have seen increased populations of them in hives. Um, this year, I have seen more small hive beetles and hives than I've ever seen. Um, is it going to change the damage? I, I don't know. You know, the, um, they, I, I've asked researchers this question. So they, they, um, the, the females lay their eggs in the hive, the larva is in the hive, it eats in the hive, but they, they finish their pupating in the soil. So the places where they are really productive are places that are warm, um, humid, wet, and with loamy acidic soils. Here with our Mediterranean climate, and you know we have these dry, alkaline, um, hard clay soils. So I, I don't know. We'll we'll see what it brings. Have you guys seen much many problems with that and slime outs and losing hives in Alameda or not so much? Um. We had, we had a hive that died last winter due to um, small hive beetles, I think, right? I'm not totally sure. We're not totally sure, but I think that's what it was. Yeah, did you see a slime out? No, I didn't see a slime out, but I did see some of the little beetles, like a lot of them. Uh-huh. Yeah, the, their, their uh, population seems to be increasing for sure. <clears throat> I've had one and it was in a, a very, very weak nuke. That's the only one that I've had a song. I, I was trying to find your earlier uh, video of it. We have a video, video of it. It's very, very disgusting. <laughs> yeah, they are disgusting. <laughs> yeah. um, so related to small high beetles, same family, smaller size, attracted the same things. We saw uh, we see low levels across this in Marin. Actually, we're seeing less now that small high beetles have arrived. I, I wish they were like kind of more of the dominant beetle species here. Um, but they didn't seem to cause much of a problem except with poorly stored hive uh, um, frames and with excess pollen in a hive. Um, and that's the... The, we, I, I affectionately refer to it as the smaller hive beetle while I was trying to get it identified. And then I started finally seeing it. I sent it to some beetle experts and they just said, ah, oh, same family as small hive beetles, blah, blah, blah. And then I saw in um, one of the, the bee journals about the sap beetle from Australia. So lucky us, we got it early. <laughs> you know? um, so it's smaller, but you can see that little paddle like antenna, it's more slender attracted to the same things. I mean, so it's um, pollen patties or pollen and in, in the, they're gonna reproduce in that. And the bummer is like, if you do have pollen frames that are stored and they get into it, I, I haven't, I've experimented with it. I have not found bees willing to take, take over those frames again, like once they're in there. <clears throat> and they'll pupate in like the trash at the bottom of the box. So. You know, like if you've got a dead out hive, they will like, you know, create this trash from that pollen. And there's lots of, you can kind of see some of the adults, but there's lots of larva in there too. But they don't seem to be a major problem. Another problem we have are mice. Hasn't been a major problem, but again, in a major drought year, I kind of wonder if, you know, we're gonna have more problems with predation. Um, when bees are in cluster, if they can get in there, like when it's cold, they can do a lot of damage and eat a lot of stored food. So you can see this was a screen bottom board. Here's where the cluster was. And at night, that mouse was going in and eating everything around them. And it was too cold to break cluster. I mean, it was really just going through all their food. There's a closer look of like all the damage as well as all the mite poop. Making the entrance small should solve this problem. Um, 
Here, these are like non-standard hive closures and then some um, landscaping cloth there. The problem is once, um, and, and that's what happened with this one, once that mouse knew what was on the inside, we gave the bees more food frames, we replaced it with a standard entrance, but it knew it was in there and it took the time to chew a hole in the entrance to get in. So. Um, skunks, another problem. You know, I, I always joke about like, I, I never really saw skunk problems in Marin. And then in 2014, during that, that, that last real drought year, which is nothing like this year, it was almost like one skunk figured out what was in those boxes and got on like the skunk Morse code. And suddenly we started seeing skunk, like evidence of skunk all over the county. So they'll scratch in front of the hives and um, it'll bring the guard bees out and then they'll scratch some more and they'll eat some more. What you can do, you know, raise your stand so that the skunk, when it gets up there to eat those bees has to expose its soft underbelly, which is gonna make it, um, you know, a, a little more careful. Um, you can all also, if it gets really bad, get some target uh, carpet tacks and put them in front because it's not gonna wanna walk across those. And I'll, I'll just say, you know, um, we do not, we have not had problems with raccoons here. Um, that's a, just like with the skunks, it's a learned behavior that they teach their young. And I'm really hoping that this extreme drought year isn't gonna be the year that the raccoons figure out what's in those boxes because they certainly create a lot of problems in other parts of the country. Um, I know, um, the, the uh, researchers at the USDA lab in Baton Rouge actually have to take raccoons into account when they're creating their study protocols because those raccoons know exactly what's in those boxes and they're always trying to get into them. Brian, just another note, uh, sometimes um, hives that are getting messed with at night um, will be more uptight, you know, when you're going into them later you know, they're, they're just more uh, aggressive. Oh, oh, totally. Handling them. Absolutely. In fact, um, I was help, I've was i been helping a client with some bees out in Nicasio for several years. The bees have always had a great temperament and they just went Cujo a couple months ago. And, you know, it, it, when, when we looked though, you could see they were on a pallet and not that high up and you could see where the skunks had been visiting at night. Um, so yeah, definitely, you know, when, when, they're, when their defensive behavior increases, it's usually a result of something, you know, they're hungry, it's a queen issue, um, they've got a disease or they're getting attacked by something. So for sure, that can definitely change their behavior. Um, I just wanna to touch on this and then we can do a little Q and A, um, queen problems. So I know that, um, you know, with, and it seems to kind of coincide with our increased problems with wildfire and all the smoke. Um, you know, I mean, queen problems can always happen, but we we seem to be seeing more of them in recent years. And that includes, you know, the, the two issues where we, you see, and just to keep an eye out for when you're getting into your hives. Um, so drone laying queens, you know, you think she's mated, she, you had brood the last time, or worker brood the last time you were in there. Um, but maybe suddenly all you're seeing are drones. Um, maybe it's a failing queen. Maybe it was unviable sperm. Um, or maybe it wasn't, you know, unmated queen. If this was a, a recent split or a supersedure or a swarm situation or a poorly mated queen. And I know, um, especially going into last winter, you know, a lot of colonies, I mean, beautiful brood, low mite levels, you know, like low disease loads. And going back in, later on and they've failed or are failing and the queen just ran out of sperm. So I think we have to be on the lookout more for these, these problems with the queens. Um, certainly, you know, smell is so important to them. And I think last year and, and with some of our recent years, just with the wildfire smoke, I'm just not sure the drones have really been able to find those virgin queens. They can't, they just can't find them for mating. That's the only thing I can, that's the only major thing I've seen being different. Um, and we've definitely seen an uptick in problems with the Queens. 
they pose a special challenge. In fact, I was in a colony, to, Gary and I were in a colony today for a client and she had turned into a drone lane queen. And, you know, you could tell because it's a, it, the, the cells, um, it's, it's got a pretty standard pattern like you would expect if she was fertilized with a single egg in the center of the cell, but it, and, and it's pretty compact brood, uh, brood um, but the, it's all drones. But the problem is, unless you remove the queen, you're gonna have trouble introducing a new queen. And, and if you don't remove her, one, you know, I mean, if you can remove her, you can introduce brood from another colony and they're gonna try again. Um, if you don't remove her, you can't do that, or it will, it, you'll likely be unsuccessful if you try. Um, and if you don't remove her and you combine with another colony, the queens are going to fight, but you don't know who's going to win. And the drone laying queen could kill the queen, the queen who's laying fertilized eggs. Um, so yeah, this colony today, I'm going to have to go back with, um, with queen excluders and shake them through and really try to find her. She was doing a good job of hiding herself. I think she knew my intentions. <laughs> yeah. I probably shouldn't have stated them out loud. <laughs> yeah. uh, another problem we get are laying workers. So, you know, these queens fail, die, um, and then become hopelessly queenless. And you get situations where the, um, the, some of the workers uh, start laying. I mean, they have the capacity to lay eggs, but they don't have fully developed ovaries. They're not mated. And so they're always gonna be, they're unfertilized eggs. They're always gonna be drones. In this case with the, the laying workers, they tend to be a little spottier than what the drone laying queens. And the um, pattern of the eggs you know, you can see here, it's kind of, they're all over the place. Some of them don't even look like, like they're not whole. Um, frequently or usually, you know, it's really only the queen that has an abdomen long enough to lay directly in the center of the cell. Although here it looks like that's the center. But in most of these, you know, they're more on the side. So that's what you're gonna see with a laying worker. You can have situations where you have a mated queen um, who, who lays multiple eggs, um, but they're gonna be centered. Look how healthy and fat those are. And look, I mean, you have, uh, you clearly have here worker brood. So dealing with a colony of laying workers, um, they'll generally, if you try to put a caged queen in there, they're not gonna accept her, nor will they, if you give them the resources and frames of brood, they're not gonna make a new, new queen with that. So a few options, um, you can combine with a queen right colony. I like to do it with a sheet of newspaper. Um, and I like to give the ones up above an, an entrance, a notch and an inner cover is sufficient. And you can kind of see here, once you see that newspaper outside, they've combined themselves. I've never had it with a laying worker colony. I don't think I've ever had a, a, a problem with the queen getting accepted with that. Um, you can also um, shake all the bees off the frames. Um, 100 yards, I have never gone 100 yards. That, that's, I've read that in some of the books. I don't think I've ever actually gone further than 30 yards to do this. Um, shake them all off, set the hive back up to the original location. The foragers all find their way home. In fact, by the time you get back with the frames, they're ready to go. Um, and then you can introduce a new queen or a frame with eggs and larva. And I have never had a situation where the, they didn't make new queens with this. Here's the cells here on a couple of these. But again, you know, don't, um, don't, confuse a queen right colony with multiple eggs in a cell for a laying worker colony. And um, there are situations, usually it's early spring when a, a mated queen is gonna lay multiple eggs in a cell. It's usually a young queen in an expanding colony that's small and, and have limited resources. So not enough adult bees to care for the number of eggs she really wants to lay. Hey, Bonnie. Uh -huh. um, I had like a drone laying queen hive um, a couple weeks ago and I took out the queen and I introduced a um, caged fertile queen 
she they seem to let her roam around um i left her in a cage for four or five days let her out she was roaming around a day or two later fine um but then she was gone and and like i saw multiple eggs in cells so it was weird it was like maybe a drone laying queen sets up that laying worker syndrome quicker than you know a fertile regular fertile queen getting disposed of and or you know yeah, I don't know. And some of those, you know, I had some queens that I bought from a source recently and I had a lot of problems getting them introduced. So I don't, I don't know what was up with those queens. So who knows? Yeah, there's, could be multiple reasons. Um, well, that's about everything I wanted to cover. And, um, but if you guys have any questions, it's nine, but happy to answer questions or chat or whatever? Bonnie, um, I just had a, two, I have two actually drone laying uh, hives and um, I rehabilitated one with a queen cell. Uh, I had uh, that success this week and I tried to put a frame of young larva in the other one and they didn't, I mean, I, I would have grafted from those larva, they were so young. And all they did was raise them as workers. Yeah, so, I, my was that was that a drone laying queen or was it laying workers? Uh, I think it's probably laying workers. Yeah, the laying workers. I've never been successful unless I shook them out. Mm -hmm. And even with the drone uh, queens, I was doing a field workshop recently, and it was what seemed clear to be a drone laying queen. And we went through all these frames three times and couldn't find her. I mean, but there were single cells in there and we moved on to other hives and we just said, well, let's just throw some brood in there and see what they do. Yeah, they just, they, they didn't do anything. So. They raised them, raised them as workers, right? Yeah, so she's, yeah. she apparently is still in there and is being, um, yeah, very, very shy. Again, knows my intentions. Perhaps I should not speak my intentions out loud outside the hive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I was I was yeah. reading uh, Laidlaw's book uh, today, and he talked about uh, some, sometimes they just don't want to raise a queen, even if they don't have one, and they will the, once they have uh, drone laying going on. Uh, and he said you can put, you know, they're very difficult, obviously, to uh, to uh, get to rehabilitate and again talking about combining the hives for the with another hive but, but you know queen, right? like I, I i was doing a workshop recently and i love doing this may workshop because it's after we release all of our nukes so what we have left over are a lot of like problem colonies or really cool colonies and i'll let some of them like rather than stop them from becoming laying workers or dealing with the drone laying queens i'll hold them for this workshop and we actually combined a drone laying queen colony, which we found in Pinch the Queen, with a laying a drone laying colony, which we shook out and then put newspaper in between and added a queen to it, and everything worked out perfect. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. tricks of the trade. Uh, what <laughs> yeah. about what about adding a, a frame that has a queen cell on it? Yeah, I've, I've done that too, but that's not necessarily going to do anything. Sometimes we'll just chew it down. Yeah. Hey, Bonnie. Um, I seem to be having a, a colony that likes to build clumps on the bottom of their frames. The, oh, they're artists. Yeah, I, you know, and I thought, <laughs> yeah. actually, I thought they were, you know, building queen cells, but they don't look like queen cells. And there are some empty queen cups. But then I saw the last time that they, there were these very healthy looking larva in these cells that were not quite finished, but they're very healthy looking larva. So it could I, be drones, you know, and down below the frames in the bottom, they can also kind of redirect like airflow and stuff with how they build their comb. So, or they could just be very creative in nature. Well, know? they they are very <laughs> creative because there was one frame where they actually had three <laughs> separate clumps on the, on the on the foundation and it was just the most bizarre thing that i had seen i thought i 
Why can't they follow the foundation? <laughs> was that right cell foundation or? Uh, it, it was actually, it was, um, it was just plastic foundation. Yeah, well, you haven't given that. I mean, the, the uh, Hive wants to have a certain number of drones. And if they don't have drone comb, they're going to put it somewhere. So they put it in between the frames and, the, and uh, glue them together. It, it's a little late now because I know, well, at least in our areas, the, the uh, comb building is slowing down. But for that reason, I usually like to put an empty frame, like no foundation, just maybe popsicle sticks or wax at the top to give them a suggestion about where to build in the frame two or three position. And when, since they can build any size they want, and that's usually where they put the drone cells anyways, they'll build out drone comb and then tend to put less in between the frames or in between boxes or underneath. I think that was gonna be my question. How many drone cells is too much? Um, I've seen a, a, more than I have seen in the past. I've got like a whole little section of drones Oh no, they, they do a lot. And um, boy, um, Michael, um, oh my gosh, gosh. Sorry, Michael, I'm totally spacing. Um, Tom Seeley's last graduate student has done a lot of work on drone comb. Uh, we had him speak and it, it was via Zoom, but um, I didn't record that. So unfortunately that's not available, but if you get a chance to listen to him speak, a, a one in the wild will build a lot of drone comb, um, but it's where they put it in the colony. So they tend to put it kind of out in the outside edges so that when they're done rearing drones for the season, they can just store honey in there, replace it with honey. Okay. So with wild bees, you know, where, where they can build whatever size they want, it's actually a pretty high percentage. Higher than we see in ours. Good to know, because I was a little worried this last time. I was like, oh, I see a lot of drone. <laughs> I'm always really impressed. We have a breeder that we use now for the second year in a row. And one of the reasons I used her was they have so many drones, but aren't treated and, main, and are able, despite that, to um, maintain low mite levels. You know, so the drones take three days longer to develop, which means that the mites prefer to go into drone combs, drone cells. So if I've got a colony that has tons of drones and can be mite resistant, that's pretty awesome. Goals. Yeah, goals. <laughs> go girls. <laughs> So any other questions for Bonnie? Bonnie, I have a quick question. I've kind of been trying to decide if I should ask it, but I have a hive that it is growing. I keep adding, I just added another box on it. However, when I get down into it, it is growing queen cells like crazy. Um, like two and a half weeks ago, three weeks ago, I took out 21 of the small queen cells, uncapped. Tiny. What, were they those, cups or were they cells? Were they, they were cups. You're right. Okay. So I took out 21 cups out of this one hive. And then I went back in. I'm going in every seven to 10 days right now. And I went back in and there were probably five queen cells, legitimate queen cells. And a couple of them were capped. I'm a little, I'm, you know, I've been managing hives for a while, but at the same time, I'm, I'm still consider myself a newbie so I took those out <laughs> right wrong or indifferent and then I went back in this last week and I found three more capped um, queen cells and of course I, I'm I'm concerned about swarming and I'm pre trying to prevent that but now I'm getting to the point where I feel like they're trying to tell me something and I'm, I'm not quite sure what and maybe I just need to split the hive I, I don't know so so on the issue of cups um Cups are not that unusual and some bees like are just more prone to, you know, they build cups early in the season, they keep them around, then they'll, you know, chew them down and repurpose them in the fall. So mm -hmm. I, I'm never worried when I see cups. I mean, obviously when there's bee, when there are queens in them, um, yeah, something's going on. So the question is, are they, 
are they getting ready to swarm? Or are they getting ready to supersede? Sometimes you can tell by the position, not, not always. Um, if, if you're concerned about swarming and want to try to prevent it, you could always just take that queen with a small split and let the ones that are building the, the, uh, the cells do what they were going to do and just see where it goes from there. Um, you know, I mean, you can still get, if, if they were preparing to swarm and it's a really strong colony, you could still get secondary swarms. Um, but, you know, less likely if you take that queen away and let the mother colony do what they were going to do. And, and that's probably going to tell you something too, because if you take her away um, and then that little tiny, you know, split starts making queen cells and they were probably trying to replace her. I, I, that's kind of where I'm headed, where I think I'm going with it. So I'm getting ready, I think in the next couple of days to, I think to do the split. So what you just said kind of confirmed what I was thinking. So I appreciate that. Yeah, just find her and take her with it to let them, a, in case they were going to swarm, let them do what they were going to do. I'll give that a shot. She's elusive. Of course she is. Of course Aren't they is. all? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> just don't talk about your intent outside of life. Yeah, don't yeah. tell them what you're thinking. <laughs> uh, uh, are you sure they haven't swarmed already? I am sure about that, actually. Because um, they'll, they'll swarm I'm, any time right now. No, I know. I've I've been keeping a pretty close eye on them every seven to ten days for quite a while. So I'm I'm pretty sure that they haven't swarmed yet. That they'd be trying to supersede. Well, see, that's my concern. And I take out the queen cells, you know, and I'm just like that's what I'm saying. It's like maybe they're trying to tell me something and I'm completely screwing it up for them. So I think I need to do the split like Bonnie's recommending and just see what happens from there. Are the queen cells in the upper middle of the frame? Uh, yes, yes, many of them are. That's more indicative of supersedure. Mm -hmm. So I left, um, I left them alone this last time because I kind of got to the point where I was like, I think the hive's trying to tell me something. Often with supersedure, the uh, mother queen and the daughter queen will uh, coexist together for a while. Mm. We shall see what happens. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you. I will report back. Hey, Bonnie. Can uh -huh. you hear me? Yeah. Can, uh, can you go over really quickly again on this shaking out? Because I, I do have a, a hive with a queen that is not laying and hasn't laid for a couple of months. And you were talking about shaking out. Well, uh, I might be able to get a new. I might, I might be able to get a new queen this weekend. And I was thinking, okay, somehow I'll just introduce her. But now you've got me kind of concerned that it might not work out so smoothly. So can you go over what you were talking about? On, yeah, uh, no, no. There's trying a, to introduce there's, a new queen there. Yeah, yeah. There, there's there's a difference between a drone laying queen and laying workers. The laying workers you shake out. For the drone laying queen, you got to just find her and pinch her. Uh, and then will they take uh, the new queen pretty easily? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. yeah she's, she's barely laying anything. She's just wandering around there every time. I, every two weeks I go in there and I see her, but there's no brood. So I'm just going to, anyway. The, the drone laying queen is easier to deal with, I think, than the drone, than the laying workers. The challenge is just in finding her in some cases. Yeah, no, I see her all the time. She's there. She's just wandering yeah. around. But um, yeah, I, I don't think it's um, lane workers. Yeah, no, if you're seeing her, then it sounds like she's the one with the problem. Then you just have okay. to get rid of her. It's just I pinch her. Like if I if I pinched her on like a Friday, could I introduce a, a, a new queen like on Sunday or something? Or I guess leave her in there for a couple of days before I release the queen? Yeah, and maybe you know, give them some new brood if they've been if she hasn't been laying very well for a while. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. All right. Any other questions for uh, for Bonnie? One going once. Thank, thank you so much for your talk, Bonnie. Yeah, that was fantastic. Really do appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks thank for having you. me. Good Thank luck. You very much. Thank you.
Thank you. All the essentials. Good luck with, yeah, good luck with this crazy year. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how the fall shakes out. Oh, I have a quick question. Um, we're supposed to be in like one of the worst droughts ever. How is there anything we should be doing different with our bees because of the drought? Um, I think you need to keep a closer eye on predation because everyone's going to want in there for their food and what they've got. And, um, you know, everything's going to need water. So wherever we can share a little water. Thanks. Urban so, bees might do a little bit better because um, people water their ornamental plants and, and weeds and so forth. Uh, the more rural or more farther suburban bees may do less well. That's my opinion. Yeah, and feeding, we might need to feed, especially new colonies, need to keep a closer eye, but also keep a closer eye on the fact that feeding them could bring, you know, predation problems. All right, any other question for Bonnie? Again, I really do appreciate it, Bonnie. That was a great yeah, Thanks again, Bonnie. Yeah. Thank you very much. Great program.